Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing food banks for a healthier generation and how these food banks are looking to have a, a lasting impact with special guest Leonard Hansen, CEO of the Emergency Food Bank of Stockton and San Joaquin in California. Leonard, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy that you're here and we can get right into it. Let's do that. Thank you very much for the invitation to come here and represent our food bank and the clients who go there. Well, the thing that I think is so interesting to, to, in talking with you is the San Joaquin Valley and the Stockton region is just such a center of agricultural production, of food production in the nation. And, and you, you produce uh, almost 13 percent of California's uh, agricultural uh, produce. And yet, the emergency food bank is so important in your community and people who actually create the harvest that we all benefit from are actually coming into your food bank and taking advantage of your services. Could you give us an orientation on your constituents, including your clients, who you serve, and your operations, your partners, and so on, so we get an understanding of, uh, of how this food bank operates and as a model for, for food banks throughout the country. The Emergency Food Bank of Stockton, San Joaquin, is a 55-year-old operation, and the name emergency tells you why we're here. The mission statement, which is a little longer than this, but the key part that is to help those who find themselves in an emergency situation. We're seeing that today. Uh, in 2023, for the first three months of this year, we are serving in the main pantry for this food bank uh, about 400 cars a day. In the pandemic, we served 270 cars a day, which was an enormous increase then, about 42 percent more. So people are finding themselves in an emergency situation. That means that they aren't necessarily without a job. Many of them are working. Some of them are working two jobs. But about 39% of them, according to our surveys, are making choices between whether I can pay the rent or I can buy several bags of groceries. Sometimes it's between the utility bill or the gas bill. Inflation has become an enormous problem for many, many people here in San Joaquin County. So if they're working, they still have a reason that they need to come here and a reason for us to be here and doing what we do. Um, so the distribution of what we do is keep continues to grow. Uh, we served 299,765 families in San Joaquin County last year. Uh, that compares to 235,000 the year before, 177,000 in the pandemic, and only 124,000 in the year before the pandemic. Hmm. Well, part of that is because the demand has grown. Part of that is because our programs have grown. But there is very definitely an effect of, of inflation on every one of our clients. And so we not only work with the homeless, we not only work with people who don't have a job, but people who are trying to make the dollar stretch. What's going on in this country? I, I, I work all across the nation. All of our people work all across the nation. And we hear this story manifested again and again and again. And it's not a blue state or a red state division. It's everywhere. It's not a rural versus urban division. It is everywhere. And it seems to be getting worse. Now, we have an economic system that is, that we're proud of this sort of free market capitalism. We're proud of the fact that it it adjusts automatically to inputs but it seems that the lag in adjusting is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And when there are these events like an inflationary impact or COVID, we seem to be having a lot of trouble adjusting and people are falling off of, uh, of, of this route to, of self-sufficiency into these kinds of emergency situations. What is your take from your community? The... The group that we serve is a mix of, of people who uh, obviously we can help them and uh, they know where we are and we can reach out and, and give them a box. 
We have opportunities to do more with that. Uh, food as medicine programs, uh, quality produce programs, that kind of thing. And we can come back to that. But right now there is in some ways um, a disconnect between uh, how our system is working right now and how we would like it to work. Uh, Adam Smith's unseen hand is not moving much for most no. of the people who are in South Stockton. I'm wondering whether the free market is actually functioning in, in the way that it was intended to. And maybe maybe we have with this concentration of means and wealth and so on, and and maybe concentration of information that maybe things are that we're seeing symptoms of, of of us needing to adjust how we actually function in an economic sense. And this is kind of a canary in the coal mine. It's telling us something, and we just need to really listen and try to figure out what it is actually telling us. There is the reality that a system that is functioning has multiple parts that come together. And the pandemic threw many of those asunder. Some of them because we thought that we needed to, and maybe we locked down too long, maybe we didn't, we don't know that. But when you start making changes to react to a certain part of the program, you're going to have effects that you didn't necessarily expect to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think some of that is still at, at play. And we do have a situation where our country has uh, a larger gulf right now than we used to. The, 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 uh, the ability to grow into the middle class, to have the aspiration to do that and the ability to climb the ladder is a critical part of a democracy. And uh, we need to, as a group, every one of us in whatever way we can, help that happen because I think the middle class is smaller than it used to be, and it's harder to get there. So more people are needing help. One of the things that strikes me as to how you do this is you also convey knowledge along with food. Um, you told me a story just a little while ago. Uh, if you could repeat that story, and, and, and let's, on the, on the backside of that, talk about how you adjusted programs. But could you repeat this story about the, the, the kale story? At the beginning of the pandemic in uh, March and April, there were many, many, many tons of produce in every community that were designated and already purchased to be put into the schools that weren't operating. So the USDA stepped in and they picked up those contracts and all of the product and they turned them into boxes of produce, 12 to 14 pounds, about the size of a big apple box that you might see in a supermarket. And uh, they delivered those to food banks. and. At that particular time, the way it worked out, Los Angeles Regional and the Stockton Food Bank were the first two, one in Northern California, one in Southern California, to receive a shipment of boxes. So there were a great many politicians who were here to greet that whole process because it was a wonderful thing. Uh, I mean, this is 26 pallets at 100 boxes to a pallet. It's a lot of food. And so we had the ability then to... Uh, to interact with people who had helped this happen and also with clients who were going to receive the boxes. We had the opportunity to bring clients into the food bank, which we do often, but it's, uh, it brought them in for this and they were able to talk with our state senator, our state assemblyman, uh, our U.S. House of Representatives, Jerry Mernings here. And Mayor Tubbs from Stockton was here and I was standing next to him talking to clients and we had on a table one of the boxes. And a client walked up and looked at inside the box and she came out uh, with her handful of a huge clump of kale. And she looked at the mayor and she said, Mayor Tubbs, if I knew what it was, perhaps I could do something with it, but I don't know what it is, nor do I know how to cook it. So that's a matter of, of imparting knowledge and skills that someone didn't get uh, or may never have been offered. So that's a job for what we do. And we do do that. Uh, we have a, a program called Global Farmers Market. It was founded uh, just short of 15 years ago uh, by a, a supervisor of the county of, of San Joaquin, the fellow who sat in my chair 15 years ago, Tim Vile, and the uh, executive director of Catholic Charities. And they put together a Global Farmers Market. And it was to go to food deserts with fresh produce. 
So we're still doing that. We've grown that program uh, up until right now, we're at 70 sites throughout the county. So there's a community center, senior center, schools, churches. Uh, we just added four visionary home sites. That's a, a wonderful nonprofit that builds housing here in Stockton and San Joaquin County for uh, low income housing uh, opportunities for residents to get into. And uh, those things are all an opportunity for us to show up, bring about uh, 25 to 100 bags of fresh produce, 25 pounds a piece usually. And then we will not only have nutrition educators with degrees who will tell them, this is what it is, this is why it's a wise choice, this is how you use it. We actually do a live cooking demonstration. So it's about a 45 minute presentation. And uh, that has a big effect in terms of imparting knowledge and providing produce that would normally not be available to that clientele in that area. So you're providing a, a whole range of different uh, support. You're supporting partners who are connected to end users and leveraging that relationship to get your product out. You're providing information and education. Um, you're also providing a, a discrete service um, of, of being the sort of the middle person between growers, distributors, and, mm -hmm. and users who can't afford. And you're also bridging the affordability gap, uh, low-income people not being able to pay the, the market set prices. Is what's going on here it, it is kind of a need to reset our ideas about communication and interactions on a community basis? Because Adam Smith assumed knowledge. They assumed that information was going to be dis disseminated where it needed to go as a predicate for the economic transactions that needed to take place. The free market requires that kind of knowledge and requires the freedom to move where the opportunity is. But if we have situations where people don't have knowledge, there are logistical impediments, there are all sorts of other uh, restrictions, then the free market can't really operate. Or is part of your solution to not only provide a product or a service, but also to remove those impediments, whether they're knowledge or logistical or, or other things. Is that, is, that, is that how you approach this? Yes, we're, we're doing it on, on an in-person basis. Um, and we're getting the word out through all of the methodologies that are available to us today, because in some ways they work better. Some of the social media works better. And in some ways it doesn't, it can, it can shoot right by somebody. Right. And so, so you might be getting all this TikTok stuff and the, the, the fancy thing, but you don't know how to cook kale. Yeah, exactly. Right? And so you, you, uh, you have an opportunity because we're working through social organizations. Uh, well, I mentioned Visionary Homes, the Housing Authority. We have sites there. We have sites uh, through a, a whole series of senior centers, uh, sites and community centers and organizations that, that invite us to come on a regular basis because we're there uh, at least once a month, if not twice a month, and uh, in all of these sites. And so it's, a, uh, it's an interaction first, and we present the entire uh, program so that they can see it. Uh, and, and that may be a little old fashioned, but it works. Yeah, you know, old fashioned, if it works, right, is the better way to go than newfangled and it doesn't work. You go, what you're basically saying is you go to the new or you go to the old, whatever works, right? You don't, you, you basically are, are agnostic. I want to ask about the feedback loop back to the growers and the distributors because California has a very famous, um, a, a very prominent issue with the fact that global warming is causing droughts and floods and so on, and it's hurting the agricultural industry. If you look at, for example, in your, your patch where almonds or uh, other uh, avocados, other water absorbing crops um, are no longer going to be possible going into the future if we have, have this kind of a, a water issue, are you able to uh, create a feedback loop in which um, growers themselves, distributors themselves are beginning to think differently based on the needs of your clients that they might not detect through the market, but you detect because your clients are actually coming to you 
and providing you with intel that isn't necessarily provided as a market signal. Because if somebody isn't doesn't have the money to buy the product on the shelf, that market signal never gets back. How do you interact with, with your partners so that they get access to the intelligence that you're collecting on a daily basis? The first step we take is we are a longtime and active member of the California Association of Food Banks. That's 42 food banks throughout the state. Uh, and we're able to not only send the message, but to receive the message. And for example, uh, CAFB, California Association of Food Banks, has a program called, and I'll read it out exactly so I get it right. <laughs> it's the uh, uh, Local Food Purchase Assistance Program, LFPA. It's brand new, they're just getting started. And what it is, is they've reached out and done some negotiations with local people. So local in Stockton would be anyone who grows food within 400 miles of Stockton, California. Right. And they're looking to involve uh, everyone from a normal supplier that you might see or a local supplier who normally is overlooked or maybe doesn't have the resources to reach into our supply chain. So we're getting all that information through the California Association of Food Banks. We also buy collectively through them with all the other food banks. So there's an enormous amount of intelligence that is shared weekly through CAFB. And it works really well. Uh, it's a it's an, a, a finely tuned organization and a finely tuned information channel so that we know what's available and what is going to be critical. And we can send the same message back and we'll get messages like we did from the client with Mayor Tubbs or when we're talking to somebody right on the line at, at, at the, they can't get something or they're looking for something or they don't understand it. We have developed not only through mobile farmers market but through food medicine programs that we've started in the last three years, uh, a pretty good feedback loop from clients about what they uh, are looking for. And because we're teaching about something that they may not have seen before, or maybe they don't know what to do with their rapini um, and, and all of that. And, and we're teaching that. And we do that in person here. We have a nutrition center with a commercial kitchen. Uh, and we teach there. We have all of that's online. We have YouTube, we have Facebook online, and we also have Zoom classes. So all of that goes out as part of these programs. We're getting the same feedback back. We use a lot of text messaging applications to be able to not only talk directly, but if they think of something, we get it back. So there's a fair amount of channels coming in. Well, I, I find it to be enormously interesting. I find it to be really interesting, this whole idea of a communication network that that leverages everything from the in-person face-to-face communication to electronic communications via phone and through vehicles like this to text messages to social media and so on to get word out and to exchange, but also the whole idea of an information clearinghouse. You're basically functioning as a... Uh, data collection and data distribution node in a tremendously sophisticated industry that needs to adjust on the fly, manage its own risks, which include things like weather, uh, but also include all sorts of other market um, factors. And you're basically helping this industry to function. You're 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 helping farmers. You're har- you're 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 uh, you're uh, helping industry players in their business model, because without you, right, they would suffer, their bottom lines would suffer, their operations would suffer, their planning would suffer for the future. So it's, it's really interesting. That's not how most people think of food banks. Uh, probably not. But we are very much a radar screen for, for many people. And we have sensors that, that, that can report back information that they may not get. The other thing about you use the term that that their bottom line may suffer, and that is very, very, very real. The other side of that is that if they see things that they can address and grow into, they have not only helped my client, but they've helped themselves. So that works out well. Well, let's describe those two aspects. And then I want to I want to talk a little bit about your nutrient uh, programs, which I thought were really interesting. But the two aspects of the, of the bottom line uh, issue is that when you're growing, particularly when you're growing fresh, 
as you're growing, right, the clock is ticking because it, it, particularly after harvest, right, the clock is ticking. There's only a certain se- shelf life. So any grower is going to try and sell at the highest price possible. The freshest produce sells at the highest price possible. But anything that is left, the price goes down, down, down until you just really need to get it out into market, get it consumed before it rots. Because rotting also comes with a cost. You have to dispose of the rotted material, right? It's not It's not free. It's not like, oh, well, we can't sell it anymore. No, you have to then get rid of it, right? Which also comes at a cost. So so there's that There's that piece as well, right? There's, there, there's this whole, uh, you know, it, it's we're talking about real, real bottom line stuff here. You're calling shrimp. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about the um, about the nutritional programs. I, I'd like to move beyond um, the traditional idea of food banks uh, in, uh, into what you were telling us about how you you basically combine this whole idea of quality nutrition, right? The whole idea of helping people to understand and seize control over their own health through these interactions with food providers like yourself, talk a little bit about how you go about providing services in that respect. We are a partner in a uh, what's called a Future Well Communities Group. And uh, it, was, uh, it came out of a question that got asked to us uh, in the fall of the pandemic. Uh, Abbott Fund, uh, which is a foundation, came and said, How many people who you are serving either have diabetes or have a family member with diabetes? And we would like to help you survey that. And they did. And we did that survey for 90 days and we got the results and published them back to them. 43% of the people. 43%? 43% of the people. Have diabetes. Have diabetes or a family member that had it. Wow. And the great majority of our group. of course, is, is going to be a lower income group, or in some cases, no income, uh, and disadvantaged in, in several ways, uh, uh, the way our society has developed or not developed. So uh, we got in discussions about that, and they they said, well, we have a program that we would like to bring to Stockton to look at uh, a diverse city like Stockton, a place that, that can use some help and can profit by this help. So they, El Concilio, which is a, a large medical and transportation and, and a wonderful organization, been here for years and years and years, 50 uh, something. Uh, and uh, they were already working with him. So they put El Concilio, the University of the Pacific, an outfit called the Public Health Institute, and the Community Health uh, Medical Centers, which is a, a large nonprofit that, that service our clients in many ways. The United Way and uh, and us and we put together this program that uh, community medical centers will refer a diabetic patient to us through the Unitas network, which is a connected network that allows us to respond very quickly and it's all electronic. It's it's wizardry. It's lovely, and uh, so we're able then to create a tailored meal box of items. Uh, the nutrition education that goes in the box to explain what everything is and how it's used. Then we put a Zoom class together. Remember, this is during the last parts of the pandemic. We started doing Zoom classes with all the people who were part of this uh, diagnosed group. And we were able to actually reduce A1Cs. And in the pilot study, we, we knocked it down about a half a point just with food alone. And wow. we were pretty excited about that. And so that has now grown and become larger and become uh, uh, more of a fixture uh, where we're doing that kind of work with uh, the Absara Group, which is our Asian Pacific community now. Uh, we just started that uh, here in the last week. Uh, so that serves uh, a thousand or so clients a year, uh, or actually it'll be 2,000, 1,000 every six months. So 2,000 clients. I love how you are creating these connections um, that that you're looking at things like the fact that so many people have diabetes, 
and so many families have diabetes. You look at the connection to information and to nutrition and to what you eat because so many people eat to be nourished and then they need to shoot up with insulin, which comes at a cost in order to settle their, their insulin spikes, right? To process the food that they've just consumed that they probably shouldn't have consumed if they had consumed something else, they might not have need as much insulin, right? So you're, you're, you're creating this connection between health costs, insurance companies, you know, lifestyle, education, nutrition, cooking, right? And then ethnic communities who have certain traditions um, who could share their traditions with others that might allow those people to eat better and create some joy, right? Through, through those kinds of, of, uh, of exchanges. It, it's, it's a very sophisticated approach. Um, as we, as we exit our, our interview, talk about how you produced a team that's able to do all this. You are a PhD in rhetoric and communications. So we've got the you, we've got a, um, a a leader who really understands the importance of clearly communicating and and dealing with questions and so on. What are your other competencies that you put together in this organization and in your board that allows you to respond in this way? The word that we started using, uh, I suspect that I coined it, is nimble. Face what you're facing and figure out how you're going to work through it and work to the benefit of the person who's receiving the service. So Nimble became our word throughout the pandemic. We were here every single day and we grew these programs starting in the pandemic. One of the Nimble things we did was to partner with 211, which is the telephone network here in California. It's all into the country too. And you call 211 and you can get family assistance and referral. Call them and say, I can't get to the food bank, I need food. We had six questions they answered. As long as they were resident in, this, in, the, in the county, we then put them on a DoorDash list. And every Tuesday, we would then fill the trunks of DoorDash cars and send that food to them. It started with 35 families. Last Tuesday, it was 866. Business, nonprofit, collaboration, tech. You've got, uh, you've got physical um, uh, services. You've got electronic coordination. Perfect. What a great example. So we, 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 we work with those people, and then we added staff uh, that could be, we have two, two more degreed uh, nutrition educators. We have two community health workers, which have gone through public health training to be community outreach people. And they are working with the mobile farmer's market. They're working with our street outreach. We do street outreach with the city fire department, which has a team of, of homeless encampment managers. And they go out. We go with the Salvation Army, the Stockton Shelter, St. Mary's Dining Room. All of us go out and we take the food and the ability to reach government agencies and a medical team, CMC, comes. And that's outreach into the encampments. Again, those same people who joined us who were nutrition educators and community health workers. That is not something that you necessarily used to have at a food bank, but it talks to our clients and it leaves them with a benefit and the skill that they didn't have. And what I leave with someone that they can keep is worth every bit as much as the food. It's just so wonderful. Thank you so much, Leonard, for sharing your experience with us. Please thank your staff. Please thank your board. Please thank your volunteers. Thank your partners and thank your clients who are part of this sort of self-empowered uh, system of, of change. Dr. Leonard Hansen, CEO of the Emergency Food Bank Stockton, San Joaquin in California. Thank you so much for your insights. It's just been a real pleasure to learn from you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and we appreciate it very much.